This week, the wreck detectives are on virgin territory. On the seabed off the Pembrokeshire coast lies a mystery wreck. Um, that's worth a dive, just to see that. But this one's not a ship or a sub. It's the remains of a giant flying boat. Are you on top of the middle of the aircraft or are you on the wing? Yeah, I have no, no idea where we are. Flying boat wrecks are rare, and no one's sure how this one met its end. Look at that. Looking at the blade, it's perfectly straight. It's perfectly straight. We want to find out its identity and exactly how it came to be here. The wreck detectives are in Pembroke Dock in Wales, which today sleeps in the shadow of the huge refineries that dominate the landscape. It's a far cry from its heyday in the middle decades of the 20th century, when this stretch of water was a runway for hundreds of flying boats. But its height during the Second World War, RAF Pembroke Dock was the largest flying boat station in the world and home to the most famous flying boat of them all, the giant Sunderland. When the RAF left Pembroke Dock in 1957, nobody ever expected to see a Sunderland here again. But amazingly, it appears that one of these huge flying boats has been lying undiscovered within yards of its former mooring all the time. Debris recovered from the wreck indicates it's a Sunderland, but all Sunderlands lost in the dock were thought to have been recovered. With only three known surviving Sunderlands in the world, this wreck could be of real historical significance. Our mission is to dive the wreck plane to pinpoint its identity. Leading our first ever underwater investigation of an aircraft is diver Miranda Krestovnikov. Yeah, that was fun, actually. It wasn't the end. And I'm the team historian. I'll be trawling the wartime records to help solve the mystery. As our expedition boat heads out to the wreck site just 200 yards from the quayside, I've come to meet the man eager to find out the exact identity of the mystery Sunderland. Welcome to Pembroke Dock. Very good to meet you. Under the Gun Tower Museum. Good to be here. For the last 20 years, John Evans has devoted every spare moment to Sunderlands and the men who flew in them. A room in the local museum now houses his personal tribute. It's not what you'd call a, a passing interest, is it, John? I must confess, it's a lifetime interest, a lifetime crusade almost. I've been fascinated in, in aircraft since I was a very small child, but it's only since I came to Pembroke Dock and I've developed this interest in Pembroke Dock and these flying boats, the people who served here, and of course, the magnificent Sunderland. When did you f first realise that you might actually have the remnants of a flying boat actually on your doorstep. Well, these rumours have persisted over the years about Sunderland wrecks in the Haven, but we suddenly had something very tangible, proof positive probably from a, a fisherman who had brought up a piece of aircraft, a piece of engine. Have you got that with you? Which is supposedly from the wreck. Who knows what story lies behind this little bit of metal, really? This one fragment which suggests that there's more of this. If this came from an engine part, the engine is there, hopefully or parts of it, and other significant parts of that airframe, uh, we should be able to tease out, hopefully anyway, the identity of this aircraft. And then a whole new story develops. What would be your, your ultimate ambition, John, for whatever it is that, that, that lies down there? If the aircraft, the wreck, is, in, is substantial, who knows how much of it might be salvageable in the future? We're talking about a unique airframe, what's left of it there. Mm. We could possibly uh, rescue it uh, after 50 odd years in the water and form it into a display. Well, I don't know. I, it's just uh, something that we can only think about at the moment, dream about possibly. But we could get a Sunderland back to Pembroke Dock, who knows? With little evidence left of Pembroke Dock's wartime role, John paints me a picture of the Sunderland's former home. Well, this is the, so what's left the of the RAF station. We have the two 
very large hangars there. Yeah. The slipway used to run in between, facing onto this water, which is all old Navy slipways. So and that's then all gone the, now. All gone. Place. The yeah. ferry port wasn't here. You had uh, the Sunderlands would have been just on various buoys here, being brought up out of the water. On the far shore, there would have been mooring buoys. Everywhere, there would have been flying boats. An area of great movement, activity, noise, and uh, uniqueness, really. Mm. For nearly 20 years, there were as many as 50 Sunderlands operating out of Pembroke Dock at any one time. What we want to know is which one of these is ours and how did it come to be here? Dozens of Sunderlands were kept on at Pembroke Dock after the war, but it's highly possible that our wreck is a wartime plane. And as Sunderlands were the RAF's most heavily armed aircraft during the war, our wreck could contain dangerous and unstable explosives. Indeed, local divers report guns on the wreck and what could be depth charges. To ensure the wreck is safe to dive, a Royal Navy bomb disposal unit has agreed to perform an underwater search. With our boat repositioned a safe distance away, they head for the wreck. The Navy diver's task isn't easy. The visibility is limited to a few feet. The wreck is also covered with marine life, and the dangers presented by unexploded ordnance remain real despite our wreck's decades underwater. Each wartime Sunderland carried up to 2,000 pounds in bombs or depth charges. If the diver finds any, they'll have to remove them or detonate them on the spot, destroying our wreck. We know our mission to identify the Sunderland could be in jeopardy. Coming up, will Miranda get the all clear to dive from the Navy? Is it actually safe to dive this wreck now in your judgment? And John and I trawl the wartime records. Anchor chain and main pennant fractured. Aircraft not yet located. The wreck detectives are in Pembroke Dock to investigate the mystery wreck of a Sunderland flying boat. How did the plane meet its end? And could it be a rare example of a surviving wartime Sunderland? But our underwater investigation can't start until the Navy have scoured the site for unexploded ordnance. When they surface, we nervously await their verdict. So what did you see? Right, if I could just take the model. You can indeed. Right, OK. And what was the biz like, by the way? About three, three, four metres. Yeah? Yeah. I went round and I found that, looked at what we thought could have been a possible depth charge, but it, it isn't. Now, I carried on at the tail of the ship, drop off the, the, the back of that, and the, the gun turret's there. Any guns? Yeah, there's two guns right. there. Two guns. On, on the, looking up the river, on the port side, yeah. They're above each other. That's it, yes. Yeah. yeah. And you can see like the shoulder which they used to yeah. train up and down on. But it's, they should be to the other side unless they've right. disappeared. The two the other side aren't there. And I right. had a look around in case yeah. they'd fallen out, couldn't find anything. The, the shoulder that they, they move on is yeah. there in place, but the, gun, the guns are missing. Well, immediately that suggests that this, yeah. they wouldn't have had guns on post-war Sundance here. So we're right. talking about a wartime wreck, right. at least the wartime period. Yeah. Right. Let me just ask you one thing, if I may. Sorry to interrupt for a minute. but. Um, is, it, is it actually safe to dive this wreck now, in your judgment? Uh, it's about explosives that can see it. Yeah, from an explosive point of view. Yeah, from an explosive point of view. Absolutely 100%, there's no doubt there. <laughs> You'll get my mum really worried when she watches uh, uh, this. No, it's fine, honest. <laughs> my mother watches it as well. You'll either be yeah. home by then or it's, you won't. No, that's yeah. true, yeah. No, it's fine. There's, there's, there's nothing there that, uh, that sends alarm bells to me uh, that there's explosives oh, hidden great. here in the corner, there's shells, really good depth news. charges. Because you can swim in this hole here, you can swim in there. Yeah. You can go in through that that door there is in place. Yeah. Which is where John said they yeah. keep the bombs yeah. in there. Yeah. This one here is open. Cool. You can you right. can go in in that one and have a scout yeah, around. Wow. Right, right, I've been okay. in and had a scout around. Yeah. And it's clean. Oh. And I can't find anything. <laughs> With the all clear, Miranda can finally prepare for her first dive. 
now our flying boat enthusiast John knows the wreck is a wartime plane, he can draw on his research into Sunderland's lost in Pembroke dock during the war. You've got marks of where Sunderland's were lost right up and down the haven. I mean, how could it be that one would end up here, which presumably is this end, high up the haven? There was a distinct pattern of of, of, of losses of Sunderland's. Some were operational losses yep. or night losses, and they would have occurred further down the haven, sort of four miles from here, at, uh, in the area of Angle Bay. And then you had the mooring area all around the RAF station at Pembroke. In the area around our wreck, John knows of four wartime accidents involving Sunderland's. The RAF has assured us only one of these involved a casualty, and both plane and airmen were recovered. We can therefore be confident our wreck is not a war grave. When you're happy, give me the thumbs up. Check, we got um, a feed up here first. We've got a picture and then leave surface, right? The wreck lies only 15 metres down, but limited visibility makes it a challenging dive. Extreme care needs to be taken to avoid snagging on the decaying metal structure and the mass of wires and cables. The Navy team have therefore agreed to stay with us for Miranda's first dive. We want to find out exactly what remains of the plane and see if there's anything that can help us identify it. To assess the condition of our Sunderland flying boat, we've called in maritime archaeologist Gordon Lepard. He watches the underwater footage with John and I while Miranda reports from the wreck. What the Navy divers didn't tell me was exactly how much of the wreck is down here. With only a handful of intact Sunderlands in the world, our wreck could be of real historical importance. Excellent. Right, I'm going to get my torch out because the visibility is uh, pretty poo down there, to say the least. The murky visibility means Mark has to use the model to tell me we've arrived at the rear of the plane. Ah, there's a gun. Pointing straight at me are two of the Sunderland's .303 rear machine guns used to defend her against enemy fighters. But as we take a closer look, our feet cause thick clouds of silt to billow upwards. We've just seen glimpses of the rear turret, and, uh, and that was tantalising. Yeah. Mark and I are going to have to end up hand in hand. The visibility is just terrible. Our dive supervisor senses another problem. Yeah. Wait, wait. OK, Mark, are you lost? Navy diver Mark signals to me that we are indeed lost. OK. Miranda, I would like you to try and find the shot line. God, but this is very, very difficult. Yeah, OK. After five minutes, we chance upon the shot line. But now I can't move. Unfortunately, as, uh, as Miranda was going down, Mm. The shot line, yeah. the line down to the wreck. Um, she's taken a few turns right. around the shot line. Which is somewhat limiting her yeah, mobility. Yeah, so she can't, when she got to the bottom, she couldn't move freely, freely, freely right. enough to, so she's coming up to again. carry on. To untangle myself, I'm forced to return to the surface. OK, make sure their umbilicals are clear. Make sure their umbilicals are clear and then go straight back down with Mark leading the way, please. When we arrive back at the wreck, the silt is cleared. OK. Right, we're going to start again. I think we've lost our model of the plane, but anyway. Oh, right. As we swim forwards from the tail section, I'm struck by how intact much of the fuselage is. This must increase our chance of identifying the plane and finding out how she came to be here. On, as far as I know, on top of the aircraft, or they move towards the wing? Uh, OK, are you on top of the middle of the aircraft or are you on the wing? <laughs> you don't know, do you? No. Right, OK. I guess in a minute we'll see something like the prop or the guns or something which is going to give us an idea of where we are. It's not a wheel or a half or something, is it? Are we looking at engine parts here? <laughs> What do you think, Gordon? Could be the collector's, be, ring, be, collector's ring of an engine. The, well, we're, we're, we're on, we're on. Yes, they yeah, are. There's the prop. There's the blade. There's the blade. That's great. We're looking at one of the engines. 
One of the Sunderland's four massive engines has fallen to the seabed, but as we check it out, we kick up clouds of silt. I can't see anything. Then, suddenly, I spot another engine, this time still attached to the wing. Right, this is it. Look at this. Oh, it's, the, Isn't the, the that tip, great? It's bigger than you. It's bigger than me. Well, it's not that hard, is it? Look at this. Each propeller blade is over six feet long. It's on my torch, and then this is just... That is amazing. Really. That is... That's amazing. Look at that. That is really, really super. Well, full marks, Miranda. You have no idea when you, you see photographs of these things just how big they are. Yes, look, she's right on top of it there. She's actually holding on the on, on the inside of the cowling. Yes. And the blades are sort of going at 10 to 2, and I'm right between them. Is that propeller blade absolutely unbent? Right, I'm going to stand right at the end and look down it. Oh, absolutely. It's absolutely dead straight. Dead straight. Good. Good. Oh, yes. great. The condition of this prop blade could be a clue to how the plane sank and therefore help us in the identification process. Oh, that's worth a dive, just to see that. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. You see the third propeller just going into the mud there. Oh, beautiful. Can we move on or is there anything else you want us to look at here? No, please move on, move on. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. As we swim away from the wing, Mark gestures frantically to me. Where is she now, I wonder? Yeah. Now. She's, she's found the steps that lead down to, to, the, to the, the front door and the nose. Yeah. OK. Frustratingly, just as I shine my torch inside, the signal to end the dive sounds. Gordon, I wanted to ask you, as an archaeologist, um, is this what you would have imagined of a plane that's been 50-plus years in, 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 in these waters? I've got to say, it's in a lot better condition yeah. than I thought it would have been. The, the outer skin has gone, but that's almost what you'd expect. But you yeah. can see the structure is still there, very stably. That rear turret, the perspex covers to it, it's in uh, remarkably good condition. I think you know, that fine silt, which is causing us so much problems with visibility, has actually has helped the conditions of the aircraft. It means there aren't strong currents, mm. stuff is being deposited over it, and that's helped the preservation. Mm. Okay. Yeah, good. Thank you. That was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> was that fun? Yeah, that was fun, actually. Yeah. It wasn't the end. <laughs> But how much could you see, was it? Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh. Yes, yes. It's a bit bad, hang on. I think our expectations were kind of suitably lowered by that first experience. <laughs> well, yes, we were a little bit worried when all the work came There's up. There's a huge amount of silt down there and it's very, very fine. And the way we tend to dive on these sort of things is we tend to sort of sit on it with our knees on the seabed and we have a look at things. The moment you hit the seabed, it's just cloud of silk just So you out. had to keep yourself suspended above yeah, the wreck all the time yeah. without touching it? But oh, it's just incredible. And when we came across that prop, that was really something. Because we were just sort of poofling around, having a look at bits of metal. I weren't really sure what was what. Suddenly swung my head around on my torch, and there was, you know, this propeller just standing there. It was just, that was really the moment for me. It was a huge amount down there. There really is. I mean, it's very skeletal. And so just, I kept, I know I kept saying it, but just touching, the, the sort of outside plating, it was just so thin, is it really? so yeah. delicate. Yeah. I mean, you sort of feel like one knock with it your fist. It was very thin aluminium alloy anyway. So, uh, so yeah. some of that outside plating is still there, is it? Oh, yeah, quite a yeah, lot yeah. of it. I mean, most of it's sort of the skeletal yeah. structure beneath. Let's go, Jen. As we say goodbye to the Navy, we plan our next move. Despite the poor visibility, we now know a substantial amount of the Sunderland still exists. One wing has fallen off, but the other remains in place. We have seen two of the aircraft's four engines, one on the seabed, the other still attached to the wing. In an age before airports, flying boats opened up the world for luxury passenger travel. But as war loomed across Europe, their long-distance capability was adapted by the military. Flying boats were designed to fly missions deep into the Atlantic to protect Allied convoys. By mid-1942, U-boats had sunk millions of tons of our shipping. 
and if Britain was to avoid starvation, defeating the U-boat menace in these seas was crucial. The only long-range aircraft in the RAF's armory capable of protecting the convoys and carrying the fight to the U-boats was the Sunderland. They played a vital role in winning the Battle of the Atlantic, sinking or badly damaging over 60 U-boats, but at heavy cost. Over 200 Sunderlands and 500 crewmen were lost. The investigation has brought John and me to the RAF Museum at Hendon. Here we can examine the records of all Sunderlands lost in Pembroke Dock during the war. It's also my first chance to see a wartime Sunderland close up. Look at that. She's huge, isn't she? Well, it's a massive machine. I had no idea it would be quite this size, I must say. Well, this was the biggest thing the RAF had. 112 foot wingspan. Yeah. 85 foot long. And this one came from Pembroke Dock itself. I well, understand. this was on display in Pembroke Dock for 10 years, but it had been an RAF aircraft because it's got mm. its RAF markings still on it. It was one of the last of the breed. In fact, it's one of only three left in the world now. The Sunderland was the same throughout its long career, but there were subtle changes. There were changes to the hull, there were changes to the armament, there were changes to the radar. And of course, the key is really the changes to the engines. Mm. This is a Mark V, and it's got American engines, Pratt & Whitney engines. They were actually put on in 1944, and it gave a new lease of life to the Sunderland. Mm. The engines before were the Pegasus engines. They were Bristol Pegasus. And really, they were coming to the end of their development life. And the Sunderland probably wouldn't have stayed active service so, for so long if it hadn't been for these new engines. The gun positions here, these little indentations. If we can find out which type of engines our Sunderland has, it will date the aircraft and help us pinpoint the wreck's identity. Back in Pembroke Dock, we're starting a sonar survey of the wreck site. A device emitting sonic pulses is lowered into the water. As it's dragged across the wreck, data is sent back to a computer on board the boat. With our diving frustrated by poor visibility, the survey will tell us if we've missed any significant wreck debris. The spread of wreckage could give us important clues to how our plane met her end. Now Dave, we know we've got the main body of the plane beneath us here now, but we think there might be bits of it sort of strewn across the seabed. How is the side scan sonar going to help us find those? Well, this surveys a corridor across the seabed in a single pass, so we'll be covering about a 75 metre wide channel when we go over the site. So we should be able to pick up the, the main body of the plane and any scattered wreckage lying around as well. When we find sort of anomalies and bits and pieces lying around, can you actually give us coordinates that we can dive on? Yeah, I can do it two ways. I can give you the, the straight latitude and longitude, the absolute position, and I'll also be able to measure on screen to the main fuselage to give you a range and bearing for you when you're diving. In the RAF's library at Hendon, John and I are scanning the records and accident history of all wartime Sunderlands based at Pembroke Dock. We've hit on a possible candidate for our wreck. This one actually tells us the date, the 10th of the 9th, 39, in the sea at Milford Haven. But yeah. there's nothing else there in this one to say if it was salvaged, if it was brought ashore. So that's, there's a question mark over that one. So we really want... The more information that these cards provide, yes. the closer we're going to be to actually getting yes. our answer. And the, the, actu the actual aircraft card of N6135 shows it was with 2 to 8 squadron. Um, it tells the number, the engines and the engine numbers. Great clues for us. As we continue searching the records, we find another plane that could fit the bill. Now this is a big question mark over T9044. This was a Mark I Sunderland allocated to 210 Squadron at Pember Dock in August 1940. Mm -hmm. And here we've got SOC, that means struck off charge. What does that mean? Well, that was when the RAF had it, took it off their inventory and they, there was no, no need for it again. So, but why? What, what happened to it after that? So if we look further on the actual aircraft movement card, it says sunk at mooring. But if we look onto the accident card now, the story evolves. 80 mile per hour gale, no one on board aircraft, anchor chain and main pennant fractured. Aircraft not yet located. And it's fair to say that the mooring area for these flying boats would have been exactly where she lies at the moment. Yes, if this, this wasn't an operational loss, 
there was nobody on board, so it's very likely that it mm. would have been close to Pembroke Dock, right. not further down the haven. Scanning the hundreds of records is time-consuming stuff. Then suddenly we hit upon another possibility. ML-766, the unit was 228 Squadron. The big clue here is it says Category E, yeah. which is right off 14th of 11th, 44. Right. That relates exactly to this taxiing accident here. Let's go to here, yeah. It was a daylight accident, and there we are. He was taxiing, lost a float, and the, the aircraft turned turtle. Then, in the last year of the war, there's one final plane lost in Pembroke Dock with no record of recovery. So we now have four possible candidates for our Sunderland's identity. One lost in unknown circumstances in 1939, one sunk at its moorings in a storm in 1940, and two that crashed during takeoff in 1944 and in 1945. The record cards for our four candidates also tell us the model of each Sunderland, its engine type and serial number. Now we need to match these features up with what's on our wreck. We've made great strides with our investigation. Armed with these crucial clues, our next dive could determine the identity of our mystery Sunderland and reveal how she met her end. Before our dive, we want to see what the side scan survey reveals about our wreck site. We're hoping the distribution of wreck debris will give us clues as to how the plane was lost and therefore which one of our four candidates it is. OK. But there's certainly no, no big objects just lying no. close by. Uh, no spare engines or anything like that. No. no. So basically no other dive targets apart from the wreck itself. I'm pretty no, sure it's, it's all a, there. It looks like just the wreck. Next. Can a Sunderland veteran hold the key to our mystery? There was a story was going around that it was taxiing on the step. And we call for an expert to sort out some engine trouble. The exhausts are in pairs, so it's almost certainly a Bristol engine. The wreck detectives are at the former RAF base of Pembroke Dock once home to squadrons of magnificent Sunderland flying boats. Our mission is to identify the wreck of one of these wartime giants lying yards from its old moorings and explain how it came to be here. As the team prepare for our next dive, our Sunderland enthusiast John Evans has arranged for me to meet a former Sunderland airman. Trevor Rossiter was stationed here during the war and flew on a Sunderland that is a possible candidate for our wreck. He recalls its first mission against a U-boat three months before it was lost. It was, it was getting near midnight when the, we picked up this thing on the radar. So we called up, and then the next thing you know, the front gunner could see it in the moonbeam. And down the path the, on the water, of the, we flew up that, and there was a damn substrate in front of us. The front gunner started opening up. I'd had to tell him to stop firing because there was too much tracer in the ammunition and it was blinding the pilot. And Trevor, is this attack in your logbook? Yeah. Can, can we, can, can yeah, we find can it? it? Anti submarine patrol Bay of Biscay yeah. sighted two U boats and two escorts, bombed U boat with good results. Trevor was not on board the night his Sunderland crashed, but he soon heard of the incident. There was a story was going around that it was taxiing on the step. Well, that was, shouldn't have been. When you say the step, you mean the, yeah, uh, the rear end. In the other rear words, end. just as it, you ta your taxi on the, this main bit here, uh, when you're taking off or landing, you put the, the pilot pulls the stick back, you get the lift, the flaps are out, and the nose comes up. Well, once the nose comes up, your resistance to the water is less, mm. and along here, see, it's a bit deeper, as you can see. Uh, you get up on there, and it'll go along like a boat, plane, plane along and the water. And how fast, Trevor, roughly? Would it uh, be going then? About 85 knots. So, 85 knots? So if you're, if you're taxing on the step, you're showing off, actually, essentially. Well, well, yeah, in a roundabout way, mm. I should say yes. You're, you're, you're but not meant to, but the other thing, danger of that is, if you're taxing too fast and you have to dip a wing or a flute, I mean, it hits the water on one side, it's possible to turn the thing over mm. because the float itself would try and dig into the water and, of course, pull the other side up. 
It appears Trevor's plane was taxiing too fast. A float hit the water and snapped off. Then as the pilot fought to control the aircraft, it overturned and sank. With our wreck lying on its belly on the seabed, it seems unlikely that it is Trevor's plane. But without further evidence, we cannot completely rule it out. Armed with fresh information from the archives, we prepare for our next dive, hoping it will nail the identity of this rare and important wreck. And John has found a very useful photograph in his collection, which means we can eliminate one of our candidates. We've got this one, though, that's very interesting, which is 6135. I mean, the photograph actually shows its recovery, and I've deduced from that it was salvaged. Mm. It seems unlikely that they would have lost it after they'd, they'd recaptured it from the very water. Careless. Well, there's that. There's the fact it's the wrong side of the haven, and yes. there's the fact that it's the wrong way and up. The Sunderland lost in 1939 in unknown circumstances was salvaged. That leaves us with just three possibles for our wreck. To positively identify it, we need to find out which version of Sunderland our wreck is and its engine type. We're hoping there are enough surviving features for a Sunderland engine expert to give us an answer. Basically, I'm your eyes underwater, so, you, you know, whatever you want to see, you just guide me, tell me where it's going to be, and I'll look as hard as I can to yep. see it if the visibility is good and, well, and we're lucky. let's make sure we have a Pegasus engine first. Right. And if we know it's a Pegasus engine, we'll figure out which mark it is. Now, how do we and know we've got a Pegasus engine, then? By just the, the shape of it will be totally different. As right. soon as I can see the engine, I will know it's a Pegasus. I will know it's not a Pratt & Whitney. I mean, uh, would you think we're going to find that serial number? The serial number would be lovely to find. It's going to be more difficult. And we have to get to the front of the engine to get that. It's Miranda's task to find the engines. What, what right. well, we're going to mainly concentrate on the, the one engine, engine that's, yeah. that's actually on the wing. We may have a look at the one that's fallen off as well. Yeah. But that's where all the clues that I need to look at and Chris wants me to look at, they're all there. So yeah. that's if we just head down the shot line and just head for that engine. Right, while Miranda dives, I watch the underwater footage with John and our engine expert, Chris. Nick, just let me stay by your side if you can. OK, okay. Miranda. Yeah. Uh, very nice As we swim slowly. towards the engine, we take extreme care not to stir up the silt. But the slightest touch and the viz is reduced to inches. Then suddenly I spot the engine that's fallen off the wing and hope this can help us. Is, is that there's a there? lot of growth. Oh, that, yeah, that's, yeah. that's the exhaust that's ring. That's the exhaust I'm ring. So we're looking... Certain. Yes, yeah. Yes, and... But that's obviously sitting straight into the silt now. Yeah. The engine is buried in at least two feet of mud. There may be a serial number towards the front, but there's no chance of finding it. Although the engine is buried, Chris recognises its distinctive design. Those cylinder heads have gone, but yes. the exhausts are in pairs, so it's almost certainly a Bristol engine. Yeah. Which means, it, which, which basically means it's a Pegasus, which almost means certainly. It's a Pegasus. With the confirmation this is a British-built Pegasus engine, we can rule out the Sunderland on our shortlist that crashed in 1945. It had American Pratt & Whitney engines. We're left with just two possibilities. One is our veteran airman Trevor's, which crashed in 1944. The other the plane sunk at its moorings in 1940. Come again, Miranda. Very nice, too. Oh, Jess has just, just handed over a ceramic bowl, so presumably a bowl from the uh, galley from or something. The galley. <laughs> look, yes. oh, yeah? hey, oh, yeah. look at this. It might even be, it might even be identifiable, I don't know. Well, it's soup tonight. Soup tonight. <laughs> it's, be, it's beautiful anyway. If you're, if you're happy for the time being, let's move yes, to the other Miranda. That's given some good Thank you for that. Isn't it? Can you yes. and Dan now move to the other what engine, the please? Oh. Okay. <laughs> now, are we are we close to where the, uh, the 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 serial number should be? Yes, we are, and it looks as if most of the casing has gone, it's gone. in this area. So we're looking for the, for the serial yeah. number on the casing? Yes, and the right. casing appears to have gone. OK. Luckily, a glimpse of the propeller is all Chris needs to determine which generation of Sunderland our wreck belongs to. Looking at the blade, it's perfectly straight. It's perfectly straight. And we're coming now down onto the, the, propeller, the hub. propeller hub. A bit of, bit of, um, bit of silt there. 
But, um, but that, is, that is a bracket prop. You can see the counterbalance, the, the three counterbalance weights. So that would make it a Mark I. The fact that this is a Mark I rules out ML-766, the plane our veteran M and Trevor flew in. It means our Sunderland can only be T-9044, a Mark I, which sunk at its moorings here in 1940. That explains our wreck's belly-down position on the seabed and the absence of damage to her propellers, which would not have been turning when she sank. That looks like because, a support. Okay, here. Miranda, yeah. that's the you're dimensions. coming to the end of your dive time. Can you leave bottom, please? Chris, I'm so worried because you John, are so quiet. Come and talk to Miranda. We were doing a lot of talking up top. I know we were you were keeping you mumbling <laughs> away, but it's like, is it a Pegasus? Um, well, Chris must tell you so what, what he saw. I mean, you know, Chris, he's the man. tell me what you saw. I saw Pegasus 22 you found one. Really? Amazing. Yes. Good. Yes. Are you all happy oh, terrific. Just, terrific. I'm down there looking for stuff and it's like you won't tell me what's going on. You're so cruel. Well, we were actually very busy. But, but, <coughs> so what you saw, Chris, was you saw a Pegasus and you saw an early Pegasus. I saw an early Pegasus and so, it has the early bracket propeller. Good, so you guys are happy. Yes. <laughs> Smiley face. <Marvelous>. Great. <laughs> Having identified our Sunderland as T9044, John and I discuss how the plane met her end. Sank at moorings. Aircraft not yet located, says the accident card. Um, the accident card tells us more. It tells us that uh, the, um, it was an 80 mile of gale, tremendous gale going on here. Big storm. No one on board, the anchor, anchor chain and the, and the main pennant fractured. Now, if it was anchored right under the nose here, there was a, 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 an anchor point here. And imagine that tugging for plus hours in a gale at its mooring. In the end, the metal fatigue just gave up and the aircraft then would be loose on its, from its moorings, storm cocking into wind, water coming in through any void that has been pulled away there, and water would get into the nose. This here is under the waterline, isn't it? Yes. So you're saying that if, if this is forced out, the, the bolt essentially is ripped out of the structure, leaving a hole which, through, through which the water enters. And we know that the accident card also tells us that uh, there's a recommendation that the hull of the type, meaning of the, of the Sunderland, be modified to give extra strength in the region of the mooring pennant eye bolts. So it's very possible they were saying that, you know, this was, um, the gale had, had shown up that there was a weakness here. Mm. Maybe this was the aircraft's Achilles heel in a gale. We already knew that our wreck was one of a handful of surviving wartime Sunderlands, but its 1940 vintage makes it even more exceptional. It turns out that our wreck is the earliest surviving example of a Sunderland in the world and that gives it real historical significance. Lifelong Sunderland enthusiast John would like to raise one of its Pegasus engines and create a special exhibit in Pembroke Dock. But there are still major obstacles to overcome. Firstly, before we raise the engine from such an important wreck site, archaeologist Gordon Lepard must be satisfied there are proper plans in place once it's on dry land. If John's team here at the museum in Pembroke Dock are prepared to take on the conservation of that engine, to raise it and conserve it for eventual public display, uh, and particularly to make sure that it doesn't decay any further, then that is acceptable, particularly as I know that John's ultimate dream would be to raise the whole of the vessel. Golly, so it's like a sort of marriage commitment, John. Are you prepared to, to take on the conservation of this engine if we lift it? Yes, we are. We want the engine up, we want to conserve it, we want to display it, uh, eventually, and we are very, very committed to this. The next concern we must address is the risk of damaging the 60-year-old engine in the process of lifting it. We turn to Peter Lawton, an expert in metal conservation. He will assess whether it's strong enough to survive the trauma of the lift. Land is in the water. Miranda dives to guide him to the engine, while I anxiously watch the underwater footage with Gordon and our engine expert, Chris. We know our plan to recover the engine now depends on Peter's verdict. Peter? Yep. You're OK? I'm fine. Good. Lovely. Right, then. Just going to descend very, very gently onto this. Lovely. Okay. So aware of the film. I was, I was hoping that we wouldn't find this sort of thing. 
large amounts of metal missing here. Yeah. So we can get free flows of electrolyte. Peter finds some parts of the engine are badly corroded. But as he inspects the engine more closely, there's better news. It seems in the main that it's quite strong. Right, that's good. I think. That's good news. I mean, it's kind of, you know, when I came and had a look at it first, it seemed to be quite together. It doesn't seem to be very fragile. They've obviously built these things to last, which is a good thing. Can you ask Peter what condition he thinks it's in? So, Peter. Well, I can't even see Peter, let alone ask him. <laughs> Peter, what condition do you think this is in? Do you think it's good enough to raise? Are we going to be OK raising this? I think so. OK. I think so, definitely. Ooh, that's an I think so, definitely. Yeah. Oh, there he is. God, he's moving all over the place. We'd like to... for them to uh, make their way back to the shot line. OK. So shall I relay that? That's absolutely fine, yeah, okay. because we've got uh, all we need. OK, lovely. Yeah. We'd like you to make your way to the shot line, please. Okay. All right. Okay, please. Thanks. Superb. Yeah, I mean. You couldn't see much, could you? Or we could didn't you? need to really. I mean, no, we, we, were, we were just waiting for him to say that's yeah, fine. You know. Peter, well, oh, there he is. Yeah. You was, seem quite confident, didn't you, that everything's great? It's not bad at all. Yeah. It's not bad. The visibility's not good as soon as you start trying to look at anything that sort of comes up. Yeah. Um, the push rods are still there, and what I could wobble was some of the valve gear. But basically, the, um, the pistons have gone on the top. You can't get your hand right down the bars. Um, the cylinders are there. and. And the metalwork, the iron, is in fantastic condition. But all yeah. in all, you're, I'm, you're happy, I'm happy and we can go for yeah. this, yeah? Yeah. Brilliant. Coming up, nerves are frayed as we attempt to lift the engine. It's worse than being in the maternity ward. <laughs> Our investigation in Pembroke Dock has entered its final phase. We've discovered our wreck is T9044, a Mark I Sunderland that sank here in 1940. That makes it the oldest surviving Sunderland in the world. John Evans wants to conserve one of the plane's Pegasus engines for display in the local museum. All that remains is to lift it. But while preparing for the delicate operation ahead, our dive team find that the engine is buried in feet of glue-like mud. They face hours of painstaking excavation to carefully remove the silt that has cloaked it for over 60 years. When they finish, we have to re-anchor our boat. Our positioning is critical if we are to avoid damaging the fuselage of our Sunderland by pulling the engine through it. OK, down with the crane. The, crane. the safety diver checks the fastenings on the engine are secure. Out of the water, the engine and the propellers weigh nearly a tonne and a half. Now filled with water, sediment and covered in marine life, even our seven-tonne crane strains to pull it from the silt. With the engine finally free of the mud, extreme care needs to be taken to stop it swinging into the wreck. OK, then. Come up on a crane. We'll clear the wreck. OK, you clear the wreck. Are you going to ride it? Yeah, ride it up. OK, we're going to come up when you're on umbilical as well. Yeah, ride it up. OK. Come up easy on the crane. Easy up on the crane, Jake. Yeah. How are you feeling? You all right? It's worse than being in the maternity ward. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's it? Is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Can you take the arm out slowly? Sorry. Faster, laddie. Come out. We're going to start slewing out, guy. We're going to start slewing you out away from the boat. Roger. Okay, Roger. 
Stop on the crane. Don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. stop. Yeah. I want the bro line on and I want you out of the water. Right now. Come on, you go, Jake. But before the diver leaves the water, he makes one last check on the fastenings. If they were to slip now, it would be disastrous. Is this touching it? Is this a... Yeah. It's just through the surface. Yeah. Finally, after 60 years underwater, the Sunderland's engine reappears. With the engine safely on deck, we've made a massive step towards John's dream. And though we already know the wreck is T9044, we can't resist checking for a serial number. So the the um, serial number was all was invariably yes in that part of the top top of the front of the crank of the top of the front case. front of the crankcase. Yeah, we didn't expect to see that much crankcase. No. I mean there are there is tantalising these whole sections of it eaten away, but not too much. So we'll have to see what it looks like on that see, side. See, it was this ring of studs that was the exciting thing. Right, they're all in place. You saw them. The and crank you... can't have right. to be there. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. In an attempt to reveal the number, we hose away the thick mud. But with the engine's casing covered by inches of concretion, there's no hope of finding it. Our conservator Peter wastes no time covering the engine. Left exposed, corrosion would set in, and this important artifact would quickly begin to crumble. We race for home, where John's made plans for his precious engine. He's enlisted the help of the Ministry of Defence. At short notice, they've built the conservation tank necessary to keep the engine immersed in fresh water. This will kill off all the marine life attached to the engine. This tank will be the engine's home for the next nine months. It's perfect, clean to measure. It's sitting there beautifully. Our crop is home. Back in Pembroke Dock. We leave Pembroke Dock knowing that this engine, which once powered a mighty Sunderland, is in safe hands. Part of John's dream to bring a Sunderland back to the former RAF base has been realised. And after 60 years underwater, this doughty war veteran has had its identity restored. Next time on Wreck Detectives, we're in Dorset to look for a treasure ship lost in the treacherous waters off Chesil Beach. For more than 200 years, locals have searched high and low for the wreck of the hope with one aim in mind. The bottom line is, I'd like to become rich.